You and I need to understand that uh, there are opportunities that serve God that are, that are more special than others. We've already mentioned in our announcements that that, that gospel meeting is, is upon us, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that gospel meeting because we need to have an appreciation of the fact that it is a great, great time for us to serve the Lord every way that we can. And we doing all the doing our very best to serve Him, and we're devoting all of the energy that we possibly can have to reaching out and reaching those in this area. And so we're bringing in a very special speaker, and we'll talk a little bit more about him uh, later. But we, we, uh, we're just going to spend all next week together talking about it. But you know, sometimes we're blind and we do not see the opportunities that are around us. And that's why Jesus, uh, uh, well, the very words of Jesus become almost the title of this lesson, and that is, lift up your eyes. Because you and I need to understand that there may be opportunities around us that we just do not see. And that's really what this lesson is all about. But as a way of introducing that, Let's go back to that first century world. Go back to that time whenever uh, Jesus had arrived in Samaria. Unusual that He'd be there as far as many of the Jews were concerned. They thought the Samaritans were not even worthy of God and they despised them. In fact, they called them dogs and to call somebody a Samaritan wants to mock Jesus. They, They said, you're a Samaritan. I find that remarkable in and of itself. It was the N word. It was the S word of the first century like the N word of the 21st century. If you're a Samaritan, you're not worth very much. But Jesus did not understand that. He didn't live by that. That's not the way He was. He had His eyes uplifted. And so when the opportunity was there, He went through Samaria. And there's a woman that's there. Now I'm telling you, she's certainly not a prospect. I mean, the woman's had five husbands and she's, she's living with a man now that uh, is not her husband. Whenever we think about getting the gospel to the whole world, that's not the kind of people oftentimes we think about, is it? We want those nice people. Well, the, you know, uh, you, you can have a nice church that is not a Bible church, or you can have a Bible church that reaches out and touches the lives of all kinds of individuals. And that's what, sort of what Jesus did. Now, the apostles have gone into the, into the city of Sychar. That's the name of the city in that area of the country called Samaria. And they've been in that city, and guess what? They've been talking to people in that city. You can't go in there and buy food without, without uh, talking to people. So they've been in a marketplace. wonder how many they saw. Those who've been in, 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 in distant lands, especially third world countries, you understand about that marketplace. It's an open mall, as it were. You can just walk around and you're all the time bumping into people. Like a flea market, to give you some idea of, of the kind of things that uh, we might equate ourselves with. And they've been surrounded by the Samaritans. Now, a- after they leave the city, something has been transpiring in that city the apostles are not aware of. And that is, that that woman has gone back into that city and has told the people there about Jesus. It's remarkable that he had talked to her. It's remarkable what he had said to her, how he appropriate he was in seizing the opportunity as they were drinking water for him to talk about spiritual water, that if a man drinks, he'd never thirst. And as, they, uh, uh, as she talks about these, the people in that city believe her. And they come out of the city back to that well that was there, Jacob had dug that well, they come back to Jacob's well. And as they are coming back, somebody is ahead of them, and that's the apostles. They've already left the marketplace, they've got the food, they bring the food to Jesus and said, Master, eat this. And Jesus said, to paraphrase, there's something far more important than there is to eat food. Now some of us struggle to understand that. Some of us struggle all of our lives thinking that a man's life does consist of the abundance of the things that he eats. That's almost the quotation of a verse from, from Luke chapter 11. But, you, you, you know, there, there are some individuals that, and, and the apostles are hungry. They know Jesus is hungry. It's time to eat. And they tell Jesus, let's eat. And Jesus, by His Word, says, I have meat to eat 
that you are not aware of. Go to that next slide and you'll be able to see some of these very words that Jesus uses where He says, I have some food to eat that, that, you not, you're, that you're not aware of. So, so now they perhaps are trying to figure out what He means. And then He said, My food is twofold, to do His will and to finish it. There are some individuals who start to do His will, but that was not the Lord. I'm going to do His will, and I'm going to finish it. And then He said to these apostles, Lift up your eyes. Wonder what they would have seen. The earlier verse says that the people from the village, the city of Sychar, were coming out of the city, and Jesus was talking about these Samaritans, these very people that He'd been among. And they had not seen them. They had not seen them as a, as a part of, uh, uh, of, of the lives that they were to impact. Now, is it possible that the very words that Jesus uses here, is it possible that these words could have application to us? Let me ask that again. When Jesus said to the apostles, lift up your eyes. Is it possible that the words Jesus gave on that occasion are words that He could speak to us this very day? Is it possible that there are those around us, those in the marketplace, those who are in the neighborhood, those who who are among us in some form or another, that Jesus this very day would be saying to us, lift up your eyes, there's some things you're not seeing. Let me begin the first part of this lesson by talking about three sobering questions. Jesus often used questions, some of them were not answered, to try to emphasize truths. And we have, we have uh, uh, done that with our own children, have we not? Did you hear what I said? The, you, we say that to our own children. We, we use questions to, to make sure that they're there. And, and so I want to ask three questions. So that you'll know the direction that we're, that we're heading, we're going to ask three questions, and then we'll get to that part about talking about the specific parts of our gospel meetings, of opportunities that we have and things that we can do to make this that begins next Sunday morning. One of, one of the best things that's hap- that'll happen this year in this congregation. There have been those t- years in times past, and it's been some years since we've been able to arrive at that number, and that may be because the, the world has changed and people are not as ready to come and be a part of this assembly. It may, on the other hand, mean that we've become rather, rather um, awkward and, and not as zealous, zealous as we used to be in trying to invite others. We could, have, we could have as many as 50 or 60 people who know nothing at all about the, the Church of Christ, the Lord's Church, Those individuals that you are inviting, that you will be inviting this week, and hopefully that number will show up. But for that to happen, we've got to hear the words of Jesus, lift up your eyes. Let me ask you three questions. Number one, if you had to answer this question, why did Jesus come? Well, there are tons of answers to that. You know, he came to be a faithful and merciful high priest. Hebrew, the book of Hebrews talks about this. David Sproul's been talking about David, by the way, is in a meeting today up at, uh, uh, up at Sebastian. And thank, thank you for all of those who went up to hear him on Friday night. I don't know if others went Saturday night. It's a long way to go, but it means so much to the, him when he's up there preaching. Thank you for going. And, and, and David is teaching the book of Hebrews here on Wednesday nights. And one of the verses that you looked at some months ago was that he's a merciful and faithful high priest. And in that he had suffered being tempted, he's able to help those who are tempted. That's why he became flesh, isn't it? So that you and I could, could, uh, could, ha- could know that heaven understood what it's like to, to be a man. Job said that God's not a man. God doesn't know what it's like. And this is a paraphrase, a very loose paraphrase of what Job was talking about, of being covered with boils from the head, top of your head to the sole of his feet. There is no way the God of heaven could understand what it's like to be this sick. Well, uh, he was wrong about that. An omniscient God is capable of knowing everything. 
But you and I need to know that God knows what it's like to suffer. And the Bible says, He was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. He came so that we could have a compassionate, merciful high priest. That's not the primary reason that He came. There's more to it than that. He, he did not come just to do away with that old system of Judaism and to establish Christianity. Now, He did that. The law was that schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, but after the Christ was come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. It's Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25 says. And we need to have, have an appreciation of the fact that that Old Testament law, that system of Judaism, is an Old Testament. And there's a New Testament, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 to 17, that says, when that testament written by Jesus became effective the same time that your testament, your will and testament becomes effective, and that is when you die. So when he died on the cross, Judaism ended. Now we've got Christianity. And that's what happened when he came. But that's not the primary reason he came. Why did Jesus come? Well, he came for a reason more than just to have us to gain our service and our praise. Jesus had, a, had another reason to come. More than just to get our service and our praise. Now, that's what has happened. We serve Him. We praise Him. We, we uh, uh, worship and serve Him every way that we can. And that's the result of His coming. But there's more to the reason as to why Christ came than that. I'll tell you, the Bible answers that big question. Jesus answers it Himself. Whenever He says, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now you stop and think about that for just a moment. That is right, isn't it? Why did He come? Because there were lost people. And as it were from heaven, He could lift up His eyes, figuratively speaking, and see all of the lost people. And God so loved the world that, that He gave. And Jesus so loved the world that He came. Why? Because He looked at this world burdened by sin. And that's why He came. And that sums it up. And, and all of these other things are, are, are things that accompany His coming. But He Himself said, This is why I am here. And by the way, Luke chapter 19, verse 10 is right before there is that publican called Zacchaeus. A little short man had to climb up the tree to find Jesus. You know that story. And Jesus walked by, and, and here is the tax collector, the publican. And Jesus looks up at him and said, I'm going to eat with you. Think of how difficult it would have been for, for the Jews to eat with a, with a publican. They talked about sinners and publicans, and they thank God that they were not like, not, not like publicans and like other individuals. And Jesus says, come down out of the tree. He was not just a tax collector. He was the head honcho, evidently. He's the chief tax collector. You know what that is? Three or four verses after the statement, He came to seek and to save that which was lost. But there's a second reason as to why Jesus came, or not, not a second reason as to why He came, but there's a second question. And that is to ask the question, why did He build the church? Well, there's several answers that could be given to that. We know Mark chapter, or Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 Upon this rock I will build my church. He came to bring salvation, and a part of bringing salvation was to, was to establish the church. So don't ever get in your mind there's no salvation apart from the church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says, The Lord added the saved to the church. And Ephesians chapter 5 says, He's the Savior of the body. And chapter 1, verse 22 and 23 says, The body is the church. He's the Savior of the church. Uh, so, he came to save the lost, and he, and, and, and he built the church. But there may be some other answer. Maybe there's a greater reason. Well, he built the church more than just to have a, have a praise team. Here we are. We're all praising God right here together, and we've been God's praise team here. Can you imagine how our singing compares to the praise team in heaven? What do you think about that? 
You think about the angelic beings and the way they extol the praise of God without a sin in their lives. Can you imagine the holiness of that worship that he already had in heaven? And yet he built the church. And how wonderful it is for us to come together and to praise the Lord together and to sing and to praise Him together. But that's not what the church is. He already, if, he'd wanted, if He'd wanted somebody to praise Him, He already had, already had that in heaven. He, he came, He built the church more than just so you and I would have a family. We've already said about we try to be family here, brothers and sisters, and help each other up and encourage each other, and that's really what it's all about. But that's not the, that's not, that's not the, well, that is a reason why he built the church. But that's not the primary reason. Why did he build the church? He built the church in order that he might give to us the reconciliation message. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll look at about four or five verses here. You might want to turn your Bible there and underline some of the things. The words will be on the screen, but these are some words that are, that are really important. Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, The love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves. What an amazing passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth says, This love that, that Christ has showed to us is something that is inside of us that says, I just have to do this. It's not an option. Oh, I could kill that, that attitude. But Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says, It constrains us. It empowers us. And then he said that because one died for all and he died for all and he died for us, then those who live and live in Christ should no longer live for themselves. Those apostles in the marketplace, you know what they're concerned about? Themselves. They were there right among the very ones to whom Jesus says, lift up your eyes. And yet they were more concerned about themselves. And they really thought that man's life consisted of the abundance of the physical things that he had. And so they said to the Lord, Lord, the most important thing you can do right now is to eat. And Jesus said, I did not come for men to serve me. I came to serve men. And to the church at Corinth, he says, listen, if you're alive, the love of Christ compels us to be aware of all those who are around us, and we ought no longer live selfish lives and hoard the gospel as it were. The great blessings of spirituality that we enjoy, the Bible classes and, and, the, and the praise of God and the fellowship and all of the things that are a part that makes this church such an amazing church. It's not for us. This is where we come and hear the love of God. And when we walk out of this place into the marketplace, wherever we go, the love of Christ compels us because we don't just live for ourselves. That's what the world does. Everybody in the workplace where you work, everybody at school, everybody wherever you are, they're generally living for themselves. But Paul says, the love of Christ inside of you changes you and makes you aware of others. And a way of saying that in John chapter 4 is, lift up your eyes. You're looking too much at yourself. Lift up your eyes. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 18, he says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry, the work of reconciliation. Why did he build the church? When he left this earth, he gave to the church a ministry. What's that? To feed every hungry person on earth? No. Uh, 
as, as, as much as hungry people need to eat, Jesus did not always feed the multitudes. He, he, did, not, he, he did not establish the church because people have social needs and, and, uh, and, and they need help in relationship to different problems in their lives. No. He gave to us the work of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ. Look at the next verse, verse 19. That, that, uh, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 18 talks about the work of reconciliation. And then Paul says, look what he's given us. The word of reconciliation. Well, how do I use that? The very next verse specifically says, here's the way you do it. We are ambassadors of Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you in Christ, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Did you hear that? We stand as the ambassadors of, Christian, of Christ Himself. I understand the apostles even had a greater uh, aspect of this in their lives, but the application is exactly the same. God has given to us, you have the Bible? God's given you the word of reconciliation. If Christ lived on this earth, what would Christ be saying? With the gospel meeting coming up, what would Christ be saying to all of those in the marketplace? Be ye reconciled to God. That's the, recon that's the work and the word of reconciliation that is ours. Why did He build the church? He built the church so that we might do the work of reconciliation. Third question, why did He save you? I'm talking about the person next to you. Why did God save you? Well, Dan, I have such peace now that I'm a Christian. Things are, uh, I was so in so much turmoil before I became a child of God, and I want you to know that I have peace. And I want you to know that I have an understanding about what life's all about. There are a lot of folks out here who don't have a clue with the, the meaning of life, and they're searching in every place trying to find out what the substance of life is, and, and, and uh, they're never going to find it. If the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and your ways, and my thoughts and your, your thoughts. And we'll never understand the explanation of the meaning of life and, and how thankful we ought to be that God saved us and gave us that understanding. Now I live. I was dead. Now I live. That song, Amazing Grace. I was born, but I was, in, I was a slave, but now I'm free. You and I need to understand that, that peace that we have and that understanding of life that we have. And it's more than just providing us hope. In the midst of adversity, we think things are going to get better. We can pray about this and different things will happen. And how wonderful it is to have all of these three blessings that we've just talked about. But do you know why He saved us? He saved us so that we could fulfill the Great Commission. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse, verses 19 and 20. It's the last three verses of Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. You know, uh, why should I do this? Because he who has all authority says it. The ultimate authority. You have a boss and your boss has a boss and, and your boss's boss has a boss and somewhere there's somebody at the top and do that wherever you, in all the workplaces represented here and then put it in the government and here's this individual to get all the way to, uh, to the high buildings there are in Washington. Guess what? Above every one of these, above it all, there's the one who has all authority. And with all authority, he says to the apostles, and verse, uh, verse 19 was spoken first to them, when he says, you go make disciples of all nations. You, you, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a part of 
making someone to, uh, to be a disciple. And part of making someone to be a disciple is to look at verse 20, to teach them to do everything that I have commanded you to do. Hello? Do you see us in verse 20? Here is Jesus, and Jesus is talking to the apostles, and He says to the apostles, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go in all the world to every creature, and I want you to make disciples. And you teach all of those. There's first generation with Jesus. Here's the second generation that is the apostles. And here's the third generation, those taught by the apostles. Well, what are they going to do? Well, the apostles told me that I should do everything Jesus told them to do. So here's the fourth generation and the fifth generation and the sixth generation. And however many generations there are from Jesus all the way over here to the 21st century, here we stand. And he who has all authority, because everything he commanded them is commanded of us, he who has all authority says to every one of us, you go and you make disciples. That's why I saved you. Now there are all of these other spiritual blessings that are ours, but you and I need to have an appreciation of all that God has done for us and the responsibility that we have to all of those that, are, that were lost. Somebody loved us enough to teach us the gospel. Somebody did. And because of that, we have a responsibility. We owe the debt of sharing this message with others. There is that great commission, and then there is that great, great gospel meeting that lies before us. May I suggest to you ten things that will make this gospel meeting great. We'll go through these rather rapidly, so, so uh, 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 don't worry, we'll go through these as rapidly as we can. Gospel meetings come because of great preparation. We've begun making preparation. We've sent letters to uh, sister congregations all over, all in this area. We've sent flyers for them to display in their buildings about the things that are there. And I'm confident that there, there are others and other congregations who are aware of this because of, uh, 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 ju just because, well, because we've been to the meetings at Belle Glade and Okeechobee and other places. I'm, I'll, I'll be shocked if those folks from those congregations do not come and be a part of this very gospel meeting. But we've done far more than that. Gospel meetings are not just for, to invite in sister congregations so we'd have a large number. We sent out uh, uh, more than 100 letters to, to, uh, uh, to those who visited our services. We, we, we've sent out, uh, 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 well, all together. I personally know of nearly 500 letters and cards, not including those uh, 150 that we sent to Sam Jones last week to get him ready for the meeting. 500 cards and letters that this church has already sent out. And I saw you take those cards that are out there in the foyer. And some of you have had those with you. Put them above your sun visor. Put them in your purse. Wherever you go, take those cards and say, Come and see. Let me tell you about a great church. Not great because of us. Great because of Him. But let me tell you about a great church. Come and see. What a blessed invitation that is, the preparation. And we've, got, we've got six more days before next Sunday. Let's get ready when we leave this day. I, I would hope we'd take every one of those cards that's out there. Take as many as you can to give out to others because that is so, so important. That, those are on the tables in the, in the foyer out there. You'll also find there those, uh, uh, the cards about the lunch hour. We said last week in that sermon that at 12.15, uh, Sam Jones will be giving a 20-minute lesson. And we'll provide sandwiches for everyone. You'll be receiving, if, uh, many of you, some of you will be receiving a call this week about bringing sandwiches and things of that nature and bringing cookies or bringing drinks. But let me just mention the fact that we're going to be eating together next Sunday. We're going, we're going to have 450 people here, God willing, next Sunday and we got to have food for 450. You know what that means? 
That means that don't you walk in here with a little bowl of, of soup and then sit at, the, sit at the table, eat like a hog. You understand what I'm talking about? That's not what this is all about. We need to bring enough for our family and for everybody. Now, if you don't have any money, you come and eat with us. If you don't have the ability to bring, but we need to have drinks. Think of how many sodas we'll be drinking uh, uh, next Sunday. And so iced tea or whatever, we need to have drinks. And then uh, that is get, to get back to that luncheon situation, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, there's a card out there that says, what are you doing for lunch this week? Why would you not take some of those and to, to, the, to the workplace? Because everybody you know in the workplace is going to eat. They're going to eat lunch. And how wonderful it is, you open that card up, it's a folded over card, and to say to them, let's go eat lunch together. And I'm telling you, it's a great, great time together. And he starts at 12, 15. We start eating about 12, and we're finished by 1. But he's finished his, his lesson by 12, 45. So if you live within 15 minutes of the building, work within 15 minutes of the building, bring the whole office with you. How wonderful that would be just to, uh, to get ready. Now, when folks arrive, great gospel meeting is made up of great welcoming. Visitors, I don't believe you can get out this building today without somebody speaking to you. You may, you'll have to run out of this building to get, to, to get out of this building without somebody. But we need to get better, folks. We need to have so welcoming when, that, when they get out of their cars in the parking lot and we look over there and we're not, we don't recognize that person, go over there and introduce yourself to them. And, and you might meet a, somebody's been a member here 15 years, but at least, at least they'll know you're glad that they're here and you, you can make all the apologies you want. But how wonderful it is. The moment a person walks out, opens that, uh, and gets out of the car, that people are walking, run across the parking lot. You know, there's, a, there's a, a member we had here many years ago, Bob Haynes, uh, greatest personal worker I've ever known in the, in the church parking lot. Over on 36th Street, he'd run you down. He'd run over you to, ta to tackle you before you got back in your car. Uh, we, we need a church full of Bob Haynes. And, uh, and, uh, and, and June, one of the secretaries, she used to be Bob's wife. And, uh, but since Bob is now deceased, uh, but uh, just, just think about that. Make folks, when they walk in, if they've got children, help them find the Bible classes for their children next Sunday morning. And, 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 and that's that welcoming. And then there is that sharing of, of, of what we have. And as, as, uh, as they come in, tell them about our Bible classes. And as a part of that sharing, then, then invite them to sit with you. You know, if, uh, uh, it, it may be somebody's been a member 10 years. Then you'll, then you'll get to meet some more members and everything. But that's a part of what this great gospel meeting is going to be. We want folks to walk in here and for them to know what I know about your heart, and that is we are so glad that they're, they're here. But you've got to lift up your eyes to be able to see them. And after services, don't you just get with your special friends and talk to those that are around you. The first folks you need, need to talk to today are those who are visiting uh, with us. And how especially true that is. And then great gospel meeting is made up of great singing. One of the attributes of this church that I appreciate so much is the willingness of so many to open up their mouths and sing from the very depths of their souls. And, and uh, there is no such thing in this church as singing off key. There's only one way to sing off key in this church. And Gorman, you need to hear this because I've heard you sing. Uh, there, there's only one way to sing off key. We're not talking about notes. The Bible says you make melody in your heart and whatever is in your heart needs to come out of your mouth. That's the melody that God hears. And if somebody's off key behind you, just ignore them and out sing them and help them get on the right key. I, there's no such, the right key is the one that opens up the heart and says, I'm gonna praise God in song. And uh, let me just say something. Why don't you folks in the back of the building sing as loud as the folks in the front of the building? Or is it because I always sit in the front that I only hear those up in the front? Maybe those in the front are singing louder. Maybe that's the ones I do hear. But listen, there needs to be an echo of praise to God. Why? Because we're not playing church in this building. And in this, when they walk into this building, they need to understand there is reality in the heart and the lives of these. And so there needs to be great participation in the assembly. It's not just when we sing, but it's every part of it. 
There's a fervency whenever we're praying together and they see you, they, they see you bow your heads and they see a whole congregation that's fervent in, in that. And then in that matter of listening. And I am so thankful. I don't know of a church on earth that listens better than this church. And if you're not listening right now, you have got me fooled, so keep faking it, and I feel so good. And when Sam gets here, just, just uh, put on that uh, face you've got on right now. It'll, be, it'll make a lot, a lot better gospel meeting. Great listening. And listening involves sometimes turning pages in, in, your, uh, 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 in, in your Bible. You mentioned a verse, and you hear all of those pages turn in the Bible. Think that'll impress visitors? Now, if, if, if the kind of pages that you have, you know, is, is this kind of a page that, that's on this right here? Uh, if you're doing text messaging, hide it under the bushel and write it. <laughs> and, but it, be a hypocrite. No, don't be a hypocrite. <laughs> that's a wrong way to say that. How can I say this? <laughs> we need to show people what's in our heart. I believe I know your heart. I don't believe you have to be hypocritical. And so if you've got this out, open it up and let them see that you're doing this. One of the things that I've seen others do, and I've sort of followed the habit is that sometimes I'll just, I, instead of trying to write down everything that's on the screen, I'll just take my cell phone, my mini pad, and make a photo of what's up there on the screen. Why? I want a copy of that. That's good. That fed my soul. And this week I want to be thinking about, uh, about that very thing. Let's be good listeners and then let's have reverence. This is a sacred time. We're in the presence of God. And so let's, let's be very, very aware of that. And then uh, great gospel meetings made up of great preaching. And Sam has been here so many times. And probably of all the speakers we've had here over, over well, over the last 10 or 15 years or 20 years, whatever time we've been in this building, more than any other speaker, this congregation is warm to Sam Jones because he's, he, believe, he loves the book. And when you listen to him preach, it'll be down to earth where you'll be able to get a hold of it. And uh, it's so important to have preaching that is that simple. Old brother Gus Nichols said to me years ago, he says, young men, when you're preaching, get it down where the calves can get it and the cows will find it. And I want you to understand that's the kind of preaching that Sam does. It's plain You'll not be embarrassed by the pro proclamation of the Word of God, the truth of God, and the loving way in which Sam will, will do that. And then there's that great fellowship. We're having fellowship now. We'll have fellowship while we're eating together. We'll have fellowship after services. Uh, we've got something here, folks. That is a family of God, brothers and sisters that love each other. And we just need to make sure that our visitors understand what this fellowship is like. I've been here 35 years, and I remember when I came down here, you folks hugged each other. I came out of a, out, out of a congregation where you didn't hug all that much, and I'd been here about six months or a year, and I turned to my wife, Judy, and I said, you know, these folks really love, they really mean those hugs, and I know you do. That's a part of the very fellowship that we have, and it's what this world needs. We ought to be, ought not to be ashamed of it. And let's include them in our fellowship. We're going to eat together. How many times will we eat together? We'll eat together, uh, we'll eat together Sunday morning. We'll eat together Sunday, uh, Monday at lunch. Oh, what about Monday night? Oh, yes. Uh, Monday night, we're going to, at 6 o'clock, we're going to be eating together. Need to bring some more food. And, uh, and, and so please be aware of that. Uh, Monday night, uh, groups 1 and 2 will be in charge of setting it up and cleaning it up. Then on Tuesday night, we'll do that very same thing. Six o'clock, we'll be eating together. Now, you don't have to, you can come all of those nights. You know, come as many nights as you want to, but uh, on those nights, that's for groups three, family groups three and four. And then on Wednesday night, it's for all of the groups. So we'll have a larger crowd usually on our Wednesday night, and so it's for all groups to be involved in the setting up and cleaning up. Great fellowship. Let me encourage you to do something. Don't always, when we eat together, find your friends to sit with. I think one of the worst mistakes you can make is to understand that some of the best friends you may have on this earth you have, are in this building this morning, you just don't know them. So when you're sitting down, don't just look for somebody that, uh, you know, well, I know them, we, uh, you know, and, and I know they, they've got the truth about, uh, uh, well, got, 
Well, I only sit with Alabama Crimson Tide fans, you see, and all of you folks who are Tennessees, you're not worthy to, for me to, you understand what I'm talking about? There's some great folks that wear big oranges, and I, I guess, I can't get, I don't know about those Gators and those Seminoles, but, uh, but you understand what I'm talking about? We need to love each other, and fellowship is part of getting to know each other, everything about, everything about. I don't know what to talk about, and well, get them talking about themselves. Where are you from? Where have you lived? What kind of work do you do? You know, uh, uh, what's your favorite football team? Oh, you don't have to ask that one. You understand what I mean? But it's a fellowship that is involved. And we need to make people understand that in this building is something that is different. And we need this week to go out lifting up our eyes under the, under the, uh, under the fields for their white and the harvest and say to them, come and see what a church really needs to look like. We're not perfect, but we have a perfect Savior and we're, we are determined to mature in Christ and to put in this very building the very same church that, that uh, the Apostle Paul would establish if he were living in Palm Beach County trying to establish a church in this very place. That's what we're trying to be and visitors, I hope that you understand what we just said, to get way back beyond all of this paraphernalia that people are calling church, get back to like it was originally, a body and a family and, and people who are ready to serve God. And then there needs to be great follow-up. There are a lot of things that need to be done after this gospel meeting is over, and we'll be talking about some of those in, in the days that lie out there. And now it may be that you've been thinking about becoming a Christian, and I hope that you have and that, that you want to give your life to the Lord. Well, it's very simple. The plan that we have for salvation is the plan Jesus had. We need to obey the Great Commission by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. You cannot go to heaven if you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. But you'll not go to heaven unless you make up your mind. You're not just going to try to slip into a back door some way or try to hold on the coattails of some righteous people you know. No, you've got to change your life. You yourself have got to change. That's called repentance. And Acts 17 verse 30 says, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. And then when, you, when we know that you believe Jesus is the Son of God, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10 says, For with the mouth confession that Jesus is Lord is made unto salvation. When we know that, you can be baptized just like they were in Bible times. And that's to be immersed in water that your sins might be washed away in the very blood of Jesus. That's the way it was in the first century, and that's the way it is in the 21st century, because truth is eternal, it's universal, and it does not change. And then God says to those of us who've done that, you be faithful. You serve the Lord the very best that you can, and it may be that you need the prayers of the church in some way. This day, as, 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 a, as a one who's already a part of the church, Something that will help you go to heaven. What is your need right now? Can we help you obey the gospel? By We've got water here. We've got ready. You can be baptized this very day if, you, if you've never done that. Or you can be restored to your first love as an unfaithful Christian. Whatever your need is, won't you come right now as we all stand together and sing.